Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Mojgan Lefebvre. Mojgan is the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology and Operations Officer at Travelers, a $37 billion revenue insurance company with 32,000 employees globally. Mojgan has a broad purview, as her title suggests, and I look forward to hearing more about the wisdom of combining these areas, technology and operations, under a single executive. I look forward to hearing more about the modernization activities she's shepherded in, the data and analytics programs her team has brought to life, and the methods her team uses to increase the digital and data literacy across the company, among other topics we'll cover. Mojgan, welcome back to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Hi, Peter. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Well, Mojgan, uh, I wanted to ask you, first and foremost, for just a brief description of Traveler's business, uh, accessible, I think, to a lot of people or, or, or m- most who are listening or watching would be familiar with it, but would love in your own words, a, a brief description on the, of the business, if you would. Robert, we are a property and uh, casualty insurance, uh, one of the top insurers uh, headquartered in the U.S., operating uh, globally in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Uh, we have around 32,000 employees, uh, work with 13,500 agents and brokers across the U.S., and 37 billion in annual revenues. Thank you for that overview. Uh, it's quite a bit of scale, certainly, uh, Mojkan. Uh, and you are the Chief Technology and Operations Officer. Uh, in a few months, you'll celebrate your fifth anniversary with the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk a bit about your purview as Chief Technology and Operations Officer, if you would. Certainly. Um, so I have global responsibility for everything technology from uh you know, anything that touches our customers, agents, and brokers, and all the way back to all of the backend engine that runs uh, our business. Uh, And then from an operations perspective, it's really customer service from the moment that someone decides to um, ask for a quote to actually getting that policy and the binding of the policy, and then any service that's provided thereafter, except for claim, which is part of a separate organization. From a technology perspective, uh, Peter, I'd say it's everything from data and analytics to cyber to, um, of course, infrastructure, um, architecture, and all things digital. And and I love, especially now we, we've uh, gotten to know each other across the years, and that, but now that you've been in role with the combination of responsibilities for some time, I'd love to um, ask you to, to talk a little bit more about your your feeling about the, the the combination of responsibilities that you have still unusual not you're not alone in those there have been others who've taken on both technology and operations there's still a very small club that you're a part of talk a bit about from your perspective the benefits of of having a single executive overseeing both yeah absolutely and i'd say it's probably more uh, prevalent in financial services um, as you as you look at that and perhaps it's because you know everything that we do and touch is about information and all of our operations really run on data and insights. Um, so the more I've been in the role, the more I've appreciated uh, why it truly does make sense. And, uh, you know, as technology leaders, we always talk about the fact that before being a technology leader, you're really a business leader, understanding the business, understanding who our customer is, what their, um, you know, their problems are that we want to solve with technology. Uh, is absolutely critical. And I'd say having responsibility for the operations, which is really where we touch the customer uh, more than anything, is has been phenomenal because there's just a natural um, ability to be connected to that part and really understand the customer really well, really think about experiences and you know what they go through and come at come at technology and our strategy that way, really always focusing on what experience are we creating? How are we going to delight our customers um, even more? And talk a bit, if you would, Mojgan, about how your team is organized. Is it split into two discrete teams? Is Are there any other members of the team that are like yourself that span both worlds? Uh, how, how is it organized, please? So at the highest level, um, it is discrete from the perspective of how we think of the functions. Um, so I've got uh, one leader that actually leads operations uh, globally across and and of course has teams that sit very closely um, in the business. And then we've got enterprise team that cut across and really serve um, horizontally. Um, And then from a technology perspective, again, I've got four CIOs, market CIOs, business unit CIOs, and and then the the rest of the leaders, again, are um, horizontal capabilities that go across. So, um, So, you know, the way I think about that is this is the functional view, Peter. 
But then what we've done explicitly, and this has been a journey that you know we're, we're continuing, of course, is really getting our teams, especially where we're building uh, products and solutions to sit together. So meaning while you may be part of a, what we call chapter or function, but you're part of an agile team that's doing work. And um, and so we, we have structured ourselves as teams and then teams of teams where at the highest level, we call it a value stream. And our value streams are focused on our customers, our agents and our products. And so that's how um, the groups come together. And then having functional responsibility for the two, it's just been much easier for me to you know, really drive the making sure that it's okay for teams to sit together and having dedicated um, operations professionals who act as the product owner within each of these teams, because they really are the ones um, who understand, um, you know, what they're looking for. And I can hear in your response, Mojgan, the way in which that team would work with the parts of the organization that in which the with which they they operate on the plans for each of those organizations, while there are also these horizontals that that perhaps take take a more bird's eye or macro view. Can you talk a little bit further about the process of the development of strategy uh, within your within your domain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, I would say first and foremost, of course, we want to be as aligned to the business strategy of the company and. Um, you know, what the critical priorities are. And so that's first and foremost. And so we've got an annual strategy uh, meeting and and a couple of days that we spend together as a leadership team, along with our CEO, that we talk about the strategies that we have and, and, you know, how they're being adjusted. Because again, we establish the strategy once every few years, but continue to adjust it, of course, as uh, we go through the years and we adjust our multi-year planning as well. Then from there, we really take a look within the um, technology and the operations organization, but really probably even more specifically within technology to see what are the um, problems that we're trying to solve and really how are we gonna address that. Um, The one thing that was very clear from the beginning to me, for me was like, for us to be able to leverage our scale, um, you know, we've gotta do things as common as possible and as unique as necessary and that's, almost become a motto for not only the technology and operations organization, but the company as a whole. And so in order to do that, um, I've established these, you know, we call them platform teams that are really working on capabilities that um, can be leveraged across the board. And then, you know, things, capabilities can be built on top of them. So uh, platform teams like our sales and service enablement is a platform, um, our product and policy, um, is a platform. Again, all of these have a foundational element to it. Our cloud, of course, uh, platform is is another one. And just think of those as platforms that are being built like products or platforms. And, you know, these teams have to think ahead of what it is that the business is going to need and, and make sure that they're in place, um, you know, before the need's there, or at least in good time uh, when the need is there. And so for the strategy to come together, there's a lot of conversation and uh, planning sessions that we have you know, among the horizontals and the verticals. Um, we probably get together three times a year at least with this leadership team and some of their extended team members to make sure we're figuring out what the dependencies are, um, if we've got short shortage of resources in any of these areas. So there's a lot of uh, collaboration and planning that goes into that. Can we get into the substance of those plans, Mojkan? What are some of the critical areas that you and the team are focused on? Absolutely. So, so Peter, I, I think of, um, you know, what we do really in four very large buckets. I'd say, first and foremost, it's uh, really focusing on creating great experiences and products and platforms for our customers, our distribution partners, and our employees. And, um, and so I'll come back and kind of give examples to that. But that's, you know, I would say that's really the crux of what we want to do, and we want to make sure that we're impacting business outcomes. And so that's core to what we want to do. But in order to do that, there are a couple of other things that we're very focused on as well. Um, I'd say that second bucket is really modernizing. And the modernization is focused on two things. One is our technology architecture and infrastructure. So really moving from the monolithic kind of older type systems to everything being API driven, microservices based, based on eventing for data and analytics. And then I would say the second one is really driving engineering excellence and really continuing to uh, make our engineering practices better and better. Then, um, so so that's the um, modernization. And then I'd say um, the third one is really 
putting insights and data into everything. And you and I have talked about like a lot of the efforts that you know we've had for many years now, leveraging machine learning, um, leveraging the, the data that we have, our own rich data and then third party data. And then of course, fourth, I'd say it's really protecting um, the organization and really what we think of as uh, absolutely cyber is critical to us. And, and this is also where our business resiliency uh, responsibilities lie. And it's beyond just um, technology or just operations. It's really business resiliency for every business process across the business. So these are the, the four um, areas. And, and, and I, I, if I can uh, double click on a couple of those, mm-hmm. I think it's interesting you, you highlight customers, distribution partners, which may assume those are like agents, for example. Yes. Yes. And then employees as three constituent groups that you uh, drive value for, whose experiences you enhance, and so forth. And you know that's that's a, at least a layer deeper than a lot of your colleagues. Uh, the fact that you've got the agent population in, as right. as uh, intermediary in some cases, in many cases presumably with customers themselves. T- talk a bit about how you think about uh, engaging with those three different communities for insights that would drive the methods and 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 uh, experiences that you would you would help enhance relative to each. Absolutely. Um, so some of some of that, of course, comes from our business partners and you know the interactions that happen. And we, on an annual basis, by the way, have what we call the leadership conference, where we get our top agents together. You know, I always participate in those and. We really have sessions where we try to understand what they're looking for, what are the problems we've got to solve for them, et cetera. We've also got a um, a research team that does a lot of studies um, to really make sure that they come back with the right themes, whether it's through focus groups or other ways. Um, They really have expertise in coming back with what the core areas that are going to make a difference in our net promoter scores and, and other things are. Um, and then I'd say the third, probably the third way is again, that direct interaction that the operations professionals have because they're they're really the ones who are interacting a lot, both with the customers, of course, um, you know, once they've become a customer and also with our agents and brokers that provide over 99% of our business. So we, we are very much um, an organization that works very, very closely with our partners and uh, it's a very tight relationship. And, and I think it's a mutually like really appreciated relationships, so to speak. Very interesting. Uh, the the modernization activities, very interesting about w- the way in which you describe that. And for an organization with a long and storied history like yours, naturally mm-hmm. there's a lot there that is in need of modernization as with any organization of, uh, of uh, comparable history and lineage. Um, I, I wonder as you've made the case for that, oftentimes that's a difficult case to be made. There's a lot of work to be done, uh, money to be spent, for value derived in some cases, many months, if not several years in the future yeah. as a result of this work. And, and I wonder, as you made the case for the changes that were necessary, perhaps in some cases uh, where people felt like, look, it isn't broken, so why are we fixing it, so, so to say, um, uh, how you've made the case uh, successfully in order to have everyone behind you with the changes that you're describing. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, Peter. And, and so, you know, I, I would say it's certainly it probably has taken me, um, you know, two or three years to really get different parts of our business to the point where they absolutely understand that modern architecture is critical to what we want to do. Because what I always say is, you know, you can only innovate that much at the edge only. And if you don't really take care of what's the core, which is underneath, it's going to get in the way of your agility and your ability to really respond to the market. And I think what's we, what we've had going for us is really the pace of change that's just happening out there. Uh, we did start with a big kind of education um, for our uh, partners just to say, what do we mean by modern architecture? And then, you know, using companies like Uber as an example to say, you know, if we want to one day be the insurance platform and really like thinking out a few years and if we want to be that platform company for the insurance industry and beyond, um, we've got to have, we've got to be built in a way where you can do that. And so, Everything that we do, every service, every process has to be built as an API. Um, it's gonna, it's gotta be built in a way where, you know, we leverage eventing for knowing when something's happening so that then in an autom- automated way, you know, um, the claim can start occurring just based on what uh, data that um, is coming to the different um, solutions. And so really making sure that we, we talk about that. And, and so interestingly enough, while well, in the beginning, you know, people were not as comfortable with the, um, with the words. It's funny, we're now like, like, you know, even our business uh, partners are talking about APIs and, and really getting it. So so that's been very helpful. And 
What's interesting is even the agents and brokers have started talking about that. And I think it was the pandemic, perhaps, that probably also drove some of this um, need to really understand and you know, know what it takes to, to truly um, have a much more agile um, infrastructure, one that's far more modular than, than what we have today. Uh, very interesting. I appreciate that overview. And I w also want to ask you a bit about um, uh, the third area that you described of insight, insights and data into everything. Uh, you mentioned leveraging machine learning, learning leveraging rich data, uh, no doubt in introducing a number of modern practices associated with that. Um, I, can you talk a bit about um, some of the fruit of that labor, uh, as well as some of the methods that you are using in order to uh, develop more of a data culture in your organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we've again, as you said, we think of ourselves as a data company. I mean, again, when when you're in insurance, you're making all your decisions based on risk and and, you know, it's all based on information. We don't manufacture anything. So data is really uh, critical and core to us. And every single person understanding that the data that they put into our systems um, have to take care of that data, make sure that that's quality data and it's as accurate as possible. And so uh, we've we've really um, honed in on first of all making sure that every one of our um, associates understand what data is and and that's really there's a training that we put together now that um, every single person who um, is part of the company or joins the company actually it's a mandatory training that they um, have to take so that's kind of how we've made sure that people understand data and then um, and then really um, again ensuring that we prioritize all of the places where those critical insights and insights into next best, best action are really embedded. And the one thing we've said is, you know, anytime that we go to build a system or a solution or implement, you know, a package solution, we've got to think of the data first and uh, the information architecture and ensure that, you know, that data is going to be visible at some point across the enterprise and understandable. So really standardizing on taxonomy and terminology and information architecture. Um, and and all of that again um, for the ability to then you know uh, write and leverage algorithms and models that we use for uh, risk assessment, for pricing, for you know how much reserving we put, and then now actually also uh, for customer experience. So lever the ability to leverage this data through those models, whether um, our own or in some cases they come with a lot of the platforms that we use, like Salesforce, um, ServiceNow, and others. And so the, the ability to really leverage that data is, is critical. Um, I'll give you one example, um, Peter, which is more recent than you know, the last times that we talked. So fraud, as you can imagine, is one of the areas that in the insurance industry, like many others, is, is something that we've got to be very careful of. And there are actually rings where you know, you've got, um, you know, let's call them bad, bad actors um, from lawyers to doctors to you know, other people who really band together and um, submit a lot of fraudulent claims. And so um, this is something that actually makes the insurance um, industry lose hundreds of millions of dollars. And really, at the end of the day, it, it impacts all of our customers negatively, because then that's where insurance companies have to raise their price to cover all of these losses. And so the ability to detect these as quickly and effectively as possible um, is critical. And so our claim team actually um, just... Uh, wrote, you know, they, they created an AI model that um, is being leveraged with some of the more modern uh, database technologies as well to have the ability to really visualize these patterns. And so our investigation team, which is, you know, a team that's established to make sure that they're looking at things that look a little bit uh, fishy, so to speak, uh, leverages visualization to actually see these patterns much, much earlier than we would have seen it if we didn't really have the automation and the technology behind it. And it's been incredible in, in you know, the ability to probably save anything like three to five years um, in, in detecting these um, fraudulent cases. So this is just one example, Peter, of you know, how, how we're leveraging machine learning and the data that we have, and then also, of course, leveraging external third party data. And a great example of, of uh, enhancing uh, human-based processes with technology that allows for a much broader aperture and, and the power of something like artificial intelligence, sort of uh, person and machine working together to develop better practices for the organization as well. Absolutely. And really where we're focused right now is trying to see how, how and where we can leverage uh, machine learning as much as possible to really 
drive as much self-service and really straight through processing, whether it's in a claim or um, any other area. And, you know, we've started with more of the simple cases where we've actually already um, gone live with those, whether it's it's in the property area and it's with food spoilage or simple theft and things like that. And then really with the ambition to uh, try to really increase that. And the incredible part is that the customers are really adopting it. Like the customers don't want to necessarily interact with you um, if they can do something themselves. However, we of course have our wonderful claim professionals who are there to assist them if they need to. And I, I really like the example you mentioned a moment ago, Mojgan, of training everyone so that there's this common foundation of knowledge about data and its practices, really underscoring that this is not just a technology discipline, but something that everyone needs to be aware of. That What, what a great practice that's, that, that sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny because some of our operations professionals who might have used dummy data in you know, some fields, um, and like there was one, one example where, you know, um, this wonderful woman was like using the birthday of, of her daughter for everything. But then we, we really, you know, have the teachers like walking through and saying, you know, if, if you're doing something like that, that's how it's going to come back. And it's not really going to help us or help our underwriters in the future. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I wanted to also ask you, I know, I know that you're particularly passionate about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and the role that it plays in an organization like yours in developing you know, better ideas, ultimately even. Talk a bit about uh, your own thinking and, and its evolution uh, now as a leader in, in an organization at scale like your own. Sure. I mean, I think you know, diversity and diversity of thought and the ability to really make sure that anything you're doing, you, know, you, you are thinking of it from all angles is absolutely critical. And then I would say in a world where, you know, again, the makeup of, of who we are is, is, has changed and is going to continue to change dramatically. And, you know, who our partners and, and customers are tomorrow is going to be very different. And so if we, we aren't composed, if the composition of our teams is not similar to that, then we're not really going to be effective in, in, in working. So it's really, it's also a business uh, imperative in addition to the fact that it's the right thing to do. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I am very passionate about this. I would say, especially when it comes to women um, and their role um, uh, specifically in technology, just because again, there are far fewer women in uh, STEM related uh, roles. And so really trying to make sure that we have an environment where there are more and more women who can, who can really be part of the tech organization and rise into leadership positions is, is important. So roughly five years ago, you know, uh, when I when I started, um, we established what we call Empower Plus, which is um, our diversity, equity, and professional um, network for technology and operations to really inspire women to again have have long lived careers in in these fields, and then making sure most step, you know most importantly, I would say uh, for allies, and which is what the plus sign indicates. To be part of this, because again, you need the people who are in the position of privilege to help the those who aren't. And so, um, our men and and you know non women would be as important in this journey for us. And so we've got we've got several thousand of our members, and both our men and women are extremely active in in this area. And um, there are many many programs that come out of it, from mentorship, whether it's one on one or group mentorship, to uh, learnings that that we do to hackathons that we conduct and uh, many other things. Oh, that's inspiring. I appreciate you sharing some of those experiences and and uh, the the power of that as applied in your organization. I want to ask you about trends that excite you. We've covered a number of them already. The necessity of APIs and microservices as crit critical elements of your modernization program. We've talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning and the enhancements that have been made uh, to to the way that work is done. Uh, facilitating self-service, uh, eliminating fraud, and so forth. Uh, other trends uh, that excite you, Mojgan, as you look to the future? Yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure, Peter, like you're getting the same answer potentially when you ask this question. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard for anyone um, at the moment in, in history not to talk about generative AI and really um, what Ch Chat GPT did to probably make uh, the understanding of what AI is and can do uh, far more easy to understand for anyone, right? Like, you know, hundreds of millions of, you know, 100 million people um, joining chat GPT and understanding like how how it can absolutely uh, make a difference. And, and of course, you know, with its pitfalls as well. Um, so I'd say, I think there's huge potential there. I mean, again, um, I think it's the first time in a long time, maybe 
the internet was kind of the you know the last time where something um, was seen as having the potential to truly, I would say, disrupt everything around us, um, both positively and hopefully less negatively. Although you know any technology can be used for the for the negative. And when I think of it, it's really about um, I would say augmenting what we do as humans. And I really hope that that's where it's going to go. And and it's really leveraging anything from you know the knowledge bases that we have um, across our companies, it, like thousands of documents that are there, but the, the ability to now actually um, leverage those much more easily to build solutions that I can can be really much more at the fingertips of whether it's our claimants or underwriters or or any other professionals or our HR uh, people, um, the ability to leverage it for code code enhancement, like it's it's incredible how. Um, these solutions actually, whether, you know, and, and they each do it differently, but whether it's Microsoft's Copilot or Amazon's Whisper or any of the other ones or OpenAI's um, Codex, I mean, apparently, like our engineers tell us, this is really high quality. Of course, they're all, there's all the regulations and copyright issues and so on that, that I think about, um, but it's hard not to be very excited um, about this. And the beauty of it is we've got our AI Accelerator, which uh, we established around three, three and a half years ago. We've got a phenomenal team that's really very focused. And you know, over a year ago, they they were very close to what was going on with OpenAI. And so um, we've we've even you know we I, I made sure that we actually even shared some of it with our board of directors, who was very appreciative. And so um, I would say every everyone in our company is very aware of what's going on in that realm. Can you talk a little bit about their methods? Uh, very interesting, this AI accelerator, again, predating the generative AI, um, um, although remaining abreast of developments there, it sounds like, and experimenting with it, perhaps to understand its broader implication for an organization like yours. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the methods they use in order to uh, do some of that translation of the art of the possible to the application to a business like yours? Absolutely. I would say what, what we've made sure is Anytime that we're working on a use case, we do it very, very closely with members of our business team. So one of the use cases that you know they that they've worked on and made a huge progress on is again partnering with um, our operations teams and and some of our business teams in um, one of our business units. Where again, in today's world, still a lot of the business um, with our agents and brokers happens um, through email, believe it or not. And these are emails that come in with dozens of, of um, documents that are attached to them. And so uh, we've got people and we've got, you know, a lot of people who are either sitting offshore that are processing and looking through those documents and then filling out forms, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so working working together, um, you know, we've, we've built um, the capabilities for a lot of these um, emails and documents to be ingested, to be processed and understood. And, and really do a lot of that pre-filling in an automated way. And I think with generative AI and, and, and as it's um, getting better, the, the possibilities in this area are tremendous. You know, something that might take weeks to do um, today is probably, you know, going to come down to hours, if not minutes at some point. And, you know, of course, we think we are certainly ahead of um, the, in the industry, but, but there's no doubt that this is going to catch up and that, you know, the entire world is going to leverage these capabilities. Um, some of the other um, things that uh, Peter, uh, we make sure we do. So, so one is, as I said, focusing on use cases with business value. And what's powerful is, you know, when you then bring this to the management committee and talk about it, and you've got your um, business leader that's or the the head of the field operations who's talking about it, it's just got much more value than just um, your technology teams. And then the other thing that this group does is really. Again, making sure that they're teaching what they know and how they know uh, to do it to others. So um, again, providing anything from um, study groups where they get together and actually literally like teach people how to do Python uh, programming to to other things where you know our our goal and their goal as as um, uh, they stated is really to democratize AI and and to make sure that every single one of our engineers for sure is also an AI engineer. Uh, but then beyond that, you know, now with the tools that everybody can have at their hands, that eventually um, the entire power of the 30,000 can be leveraged in this round. Very interesting. Again, I, I love how accessible uh, your organization is making an esoteric topic to the rest of the organization so that, again, everyone is sort of operating at least with a common foundation as they contemplate the future of these topics. 
The, the um, other thing we're doing, uh, Peter, sorry to interrupt you, but maybe just just um, you know one other thing. And so again, taking a page out of what we did with the data culture um, training, um, and I actually was just talking about this with our learning leader, who's done a phenomenal job of, of really thinking about you know what we need to and should be doing and uh, putting together a curriculum which we call uh, digital fluency for for the enterprise. And so again, it's got different modules. But there's a tech foundation module that we think is absolutely critical for every single person in the organization um, to take. And so, um, again, leveraging both internal and external uh, resources to pull this together. And we just did a pilot with around 150 of our um, operations folks, you know, and that's yet again another advantage of having that group, um, you know, in my organization and, and tried it out. And the feedback was phenomenal for these. 12 courses that it takes you up to nine hours to, to take. And there are just, you know, micro kind of micro bursts of, of video where, you know, concepts from the API economy to cloud and other things are, are really explained in a way where everyone can understand it. Oh, fantastic. Again, a great, great example, Moshkan. Thank you for, for adding that. I wanted to ask you a bit about the secrets to your success, Moshkan. As somebody who's been a uh, a technology leader across four different uh, scaled organizations. Now, again, this broader set of responsibilities that you have uh, uh, in your current setting. Um, as you reflect upon the journey, what have been some of the difference makers along the way that have uh, you know enabled you to achieve the heights you have professionally? Yeah, well, um, thank you for, for that question. You know, um, of course, uh, I'm sure that I'm, I'm privileged. Let's let's just put it that way. I'm lucky to to have had these opportunities. Um, when I think of, of um, you know, how this happened, I kind of think of my uh, journey in, in buckets. And, you know, the first one is that, you know, I, I was born in a country where unfortunately, like due to a revolution and a change of government, it was obvious to me that women wouldn't have the opportunity that, um, you know, I wanted to. Um, and I, you know, being very ambitious. And so um, knew that I needed to leave that country. And uh, my parents, unfortunately, couldn't afford to send me. So, you know, graduating from high school, I actually worked um, for about a year and a half, put some money together and applied to schools in the U.S. That was my desire to come to the U.S. and, and was lucky enough to get the visa. And, um, you know, at the age of 19, with just, you know, let's say a few dollars in, in my pocket on my own, came thousands of miles away. And and so I, when I think of that, I'm like, well, you know, that took courage. So I'm like, courage was absolutely um, a big piece of, of what has kind of driven me to where, where I am and, and really not being afraid to stretch yourself and put, it, put yourself in situations which um, may not necessarily work out the way you thought, but um, if you want to do it, just go for it. It's like, you know, having that courage is absolutely critical. And as I think through through my career, I think, you know, the, those decisions have happened along the way multiple times. Um, I'd say secondly, uh, Peter, I, I, you know, I tell everyone, including my kids, that like one of the most important skills to have, regardless of what your role is, whether you're a, a software engineer or you're a marketing person, is communication skills. So the ability to read and write, well, read, of course, <laughs> but to write well and to communicate in a way where, you know, regardless of who you're talking to, you can um, have the conversation in a way where you're telling the story in a way that they understand it in their context. That's absolutely critical. So I'd say, you know, that that's certainly uh, paid off. And I think that's very important because, again, you've got to be able to tell the story, um, you know, as we talked a lot about um, earlier in, in, in our conversation. Um, and then I would say my third C. So, you know, we've got the courage, we've got the communication. And my third C is one that I would absolutely never have been able to be where I am without. And that's, I'd say, connections um, and relationships, really uh, some critical connections that at the end of the day, you know, without the help of others, uh, you can't really progress. Um, and that's where, again, I say allyship is just so critical. And when I think back to my career, probably um, one of the uh, biggest um, drivers of, of my success and the ability to go into leadership and management was uh, one manager that I recall where he and I just bonded around um, talking about cultural topics. He was from India, I was from Iran. And so we just bonded around that. And so getting to know each other and, you know, he he was um, a couple of layers uh, above me. And so he gave me the opportunity to uh, become part of a project that became a very global project. So he took a chance on me. And so I think that really propelled me into um, 
leadership where it might have taken me much longer. And so, so I think of those three, um, Peter, the, the courage, um, communication and connections as, as some of the things that have uh, really made a difference in my life. Oh, I appreciate you sharing those, Mojgan. It's really, really well articulated, very well communicated to, to go back to one of the C's, um, <laughs> as is certainly apparent across our conversation, um, how, how well you convey the, the, the various things that you and the team are driving, uh, as well as the difference makers along the way. I appreciate uh, the very thoughtful conversation throughout, Mojgan. Thank you so much for making time for me today. Thank you, Peter. As always, a pleasure. And thank you for the conversation. I always learn so much from you. So I appreciate that. You're kind to say that. Thank you.